Hello everybody and welcome to tier 5 of the Film Fan Theories Iceberg. Thank you again for all the support everybody, uh, I really appreciate it. Let's get right into it. Humans are actually insects in Star Wars. So this is a really weird one, definitely go off and like read the whole article about this but it basically, yeah it's, it's the title says it all. Essentially there's like a hierarchy, it, it, it really, to be kind of honest with you, it didn't make too much sense to me but it, there are a few parallels like the emperor having to create clones so that there can be normal reproduction because he's like the queen or the king or the, the emperor of all the bees and the insects. The Death Star, uh, the Death Stars, both Death Stars were actually artificial hives and lightsabers actually sound like bees buzzing. Uh, so they're actually, what if they're actually like, you know, stingers, basically. There, there's just some plethora of, uh, of th points that posit this uh, and support this. So I highly recommend if you're interested in this one, go and check it out. Uh, but yeah, basically it goes through the fact that, you know, everyone, like everyone's an insect and there's a hierarchy and it's, it's quite complicated in a way. Um, to, to sort of explain but those are the, the sort of big pieces of evidence that that were like interesting things that sort of came out to me like uh, popped up popped out to me Michael Myers is a cyborg so some people think because of his like immortality Michael Myers is a cyborg and I actually think that there is another point to this that would make a lot of sense which is he keeps coming back for the same family he keeps coming back to kill the same family right which would make sense in a in an androids sense of programming right it's coming back to essentially kill the same person because the programming hasn't changed so that would make a lot of sense and I, like the things he survives like I've only seen Halloween 19 mid-1978 mid late 70s early 80s and you know the fact that he survives all of the inflictions in that film is absolutely insane i've watched a bit of uh halloween 2018 as well but yeah it, we know there are a lot of halloween films and lots of things happen to him and he has like no emotion whatsoever which would also make sense that he's a cyborg as well or i guess well cyborg suggests half human half uh uh, robot but maybe he's maybe he's got a robot brain like programming and the rest of it is him is like human or like he has enhanced uh, organs so that that still works i think most paul dano dies at the beginning of swiss army man so we all know that this film is absolutely mental like there's there's so many fantastical things that happen in it and the theory basically says that essentially the, at the beginning of the film he dies and that's why he's able to communicate with this corpse so much and sort of the end is him like coming to terms with his death lots of films have this theory we've already covered breakfast club it is ex the exact same thing except it's more to do with purgatory but it goes along the same you know it's along the same lines i think this one pretty much works just given the fact that everything that happens in this film is so unrealistic but i mean you know there's nothing wrong like drive that's a dreamlike film and i like drive before all the film bros liked it okay i remember someone called me a film bro once because that was on my letterbox it's like bro i, I invented the film bro okay or well, not just me but like people I, i've i've known as well they've liked it for all that but i think it actually makes a lot of sense like manny using hank as a jet ski while he's farting <laughs> you know there's just so many things in it that point towards that and uh, it basically, you know, again, through lots of films, we don't know if his perspective or Manny's perspective is real. Uh, and it could also be that Hank is a reflection of Manny because he's already dead, right? So that, that would make a lot of sense. I, I quite like this one um, in terms of like purgatory death theories. I think it sticks the landing quite a bit. Fiona from Shrek is a cannibal. So the Just Nobody's podcast sort of gave me this idea, the idea to put this in. I think it's just nobody's so there's a scene where I think Shrek is like walking with Fiona out of the castle when he after he's quote unquote saved her and you can see a giant book how to cook a knight that was obviously for the dragon because why is it a giant book why why would you need a giant book realistically the dragon I think is Elizabeth I actually found out as well from from the same podcast I just mentioned uh, she she's just gonna eat that knight like whole basically right like she's not worried about it cooking uh, it and maybe you know uh, there's also it ties into the theory that again just nobody's podcast that 
she was once a princess as well and she was turned into like fiona was turned into an ogre uh was turned into a dragon perhaps by lord farquaad it's fucking hilarious and like what else is she eating there because like you look at the castle there it's run down there there's nothing in terms of like storage really there i don't think it just it's completely dilapidated right so there are a lot of lot of pieces of evidence that would suggest this to be one of century basically and you know you can't i wouldn't put it past the, the shrek creators you know beetlejuice is the ghost of batman to be honest this one doesn't really work like whatsoever the only thing that is a piece of evidence for this is that there are like during like one sequence where Beetlejuice is like sort of doing like a carnival, like he becomes like this weird carnival thing. There are wings attached to him and that's it basically. And it's Michael Keane. That's it. That's literally it. That's all I could find at least. This one definitely shouldn't be this far down and it, it's just not that good. It's not that good, this one. It's not a very good theory, in my opinion. The Riddler in the Batman is actually Hush. So we know that uh, Edward is very proficient in giving multiple identities and giving away, sort of suggesting different identities. But one, one scene in the film that really sort of makes me believe that it's the case is he gives two identities to the, to the cops, to Ramirez specifically. <clears throat> and it doesn't make much sense why he'd want to, I suppose because he, it's like a mini riddle of like, like so he gives two different identities, uh, I'm sure you guys remember. One is Edward Nashton, and then one is uh, Edward, I forgot what the other one is, uh, and they're, ba they're very similar. Uh, and he's saying, you tell me, and they're like, which one is real? Why do like a five second thing for that? Do you know what I mean? Like why troll them for like five seconds for them to check and then go, oh, okay, he's this guy. That makes me suggest that neither of them are real and that he's actually Elliot, Thomas Elliot, because firstly, he grew up alongside Bruce and there's actually in the prequel novel, there's a scene where Bruce looks at Riddler in during the scene where Thomas announces he's going to run for mayor, Thomas Wayne. There's a scene where they make eye contact. They both like wear like sort of bandage sort of things. You know what I mean? Like duct tape is kind of, it, it's very reminiscent of bandages in a way, if you look at it, you know, these strips like wrapped around them, very similar. And he's such a, no pun intended, enigmatic individual, mysterious individual that I think he would have another thing up his sleeve that, you know, a third thing, third ident identity, right? He's a very smart man. Also his anger at Bruce in his video, exposing Thomas Wayne. Like we know he's he gets angry about corruption, but his just anger towards Thomas Wayne just and Bruce in again in the prequel novel, and and it, well even in the scene where he's being interrogated, right? It it would suggest that there could be something more a more personal thing going on there, and that they actually had more of a relationship as Hush and Bruce did in the comics. It also would be an interesting layers add, but it's not you know I don't personally believe it, but it's one that I don't know. It's just a cool theory, man. Hopefully they do Hush in. Uh, the Batman part two, there are rumors that that will happen. So I'm very excited for that. And Clayface, very excited. Legend, fucking Matt Reeves, are, they're all legends, man. Yeah. Very excited. The only like thing is like counter argument wise is Matt Reeves is very good at giving us clues and hinting us towards a certain thing. And there are some Easter eggs that aren't doing that, are very symbolic and very hidden, as you can find in my hidden symbolism series that uh hopefully part two will be out soon so he's a bit more deliberate with that so it wouldn't make sense that it would be hush in that sense in a narrative writing way but then again he writes with another writer i can't remember his name very good writer so they could be meshing those those styles there uh, but it feels like it, it's quite unintentional if it is the case and that's why i don't really believe it to be honest it's, it doesn't it, there's just no real evidence apart from elliot being mentioned and the the things things i've said Spider-Man Far From Home is about school shootings. This one was quite difficult for me to actually pin down on what, what, it, what it sort of meant. But essentially what it's saying is in the world of the MCU, the aftermath of the blip, it's very similar to school shootings, right? The fact that this big event happens, the desensitization of all the kids to events like school shootings and, you know, that it's actually about that and about their sort of nonchalant way of talking about the blip, which would represent school shootings. And there's actually a really good article that you can read about it. 
the fact that like anxiety is risen after the blip just like there are school shootings it would actually make sense as well like why they every character would be so like nonchalant and just so like relaxed because obviously they're, they're superheroes so they're not afraid of, of something like that and that's why they just don't worry about it too much it's all, t all about going back to normality after trauma and after something that's uh, horrible has happened. So it doesn't mean specifically, you know, like a school shooting happened in, actually happened in the film. It's more like an allegory, if that makes sense, which is really, really, really interesting. I actually really, this one is fascinating to me. The Last Jedi is about sex. <laughs> so basically because of the sort of themes of, in this film of like awaken, people believe could represent sexual awakening sexuality pardon me uh sexual expression and there is there's also lots of imagery uh in terms of like physical imagery between your know, kylo and ray you know touching which could represent oh you know a, a more intimate thing there's the scene where obviously he has his shirt off and she's quite uncomfortable and like oh you know what i mean she sort of looks at him and looks at him in a weird way uh, so it's like basically saying that this film is about sexual awakening. You could also say, you know, like the this, this scene where she dips her hand in the forest, that could be an allegory for sexuality. Uh, the inside of the tree and that they go into it and it, which doesn't really, I don't really think that one has anything to do. I think that's just a cool set piece. Um, and the, the tension is weird, I think is the main thing between Kylo and Rey. Like it's so, it there's no real purpose for it in terms of like why why is this happening apart from them to like get together because ryan johnson probably wanted that to happen because he wants to do something different as he always fucking does so yeah it's it's an interesting one to think about in terms of allegorically but i think that there's not any real evidence for it apart from a few things there that could be pulled upon but it's, it's still an interesting allegory and adds again you know layers to to the film that's for sure the Dark Knight is a retelling of the Book of Job. So basically because of Bruce's love and protection and dedication to Gotham, people think that it's a parallel to the Book of Job. Uh, basically Job, he doesn't, he never wavers in his beliefs in God. He never gives up, uh, never give up, never surrender. I don't know where that's from, but it just came out. Um, he's resistant to any of that bullshit right he's always he always continues to keep going and keep pushing on and people think because of that and perhaps some some sort of statuesque symbolism and some sort of like you know he's a symbol batman's a symbol could also be a parallel to job i'm sure that people have made different comments on this but i think that is the main piece of evidence that really is the most important or the most convincing kermit the frog calls 9-11 <laughs> so i struggled to say that without laughing but it's an absolute meme like when you say it out loud like just try just say that out loud just say it out loud and you'll know, you'll know what i mean so basically there's a part of the one of the muppet christmas smash specials sorry where we see a glimpse into like a universe where Kermit the Frog didn't uh, didn't exist, and the Twin Towers are still up, <laughs> which is fucking weird. Uh, so this basically suggests that what if, like you know, indirectly or directly, Kermit uh, calls 9/11, which is just hilarious. It's just fucking hilarious, and um, it's just funny. It's just I know I'm not trying to be uh, insensitive to people who suffered during 9/11 or anything. It's, it's just the fact that Kermit the fucking frog did it. It's, it's the funny part. Bo is Afraid takes place inside Bo's dying mind. So basically, there is, is so much random shit that goes on in Bo is Afraid that makes it incoherent in a way. But instead of sort of putting all, those, all of those together and perhaps uh, tying it to mental illness, T uh, tying it to trauma and tying it to specific reflections it ties into one whole thing which is that the entire film again takes place inside his dying mind throughout the whole film we see lots of mentions of death uh, especially in terms of drowning there's there are many sequences where uh, it's it looks as if that is a big parallel 
there's a traumatic event that Bo sees where uh, he's drowning in the tub and he's seeing his pr twin brother. There's the, the very end of the film with the boat twitching. And basically what it says, what this posits is that he's already starting to die. And this is all it's sort of him recapping and retelling his life uh, through his mind, right? And also imagining a lot of things, hallucinating most of it. Uh, and that it ends finally in him again admitting death which we've talked we've touched upon many times but this one i honestly th it's the most uh the one this is probably the death death theory purgatory theory that i love the most because for me Bo is afraid just didn't make a lot of sense especially in terms of like uh ari aster's other works even for ari aster this film was uh uh, quite absurd and quite surrealist so it would make a lot of sense uh, and I mean like you know you guys probably know the attic scene itself is ridiculous and just doesn't make any sense in a literal sense but also even in a metaphorical sense so perhaps you know perhaps he's dying close to his mum and his mum is like with him that's why she's sentencing him that's why she pretends to be dead or something uh, maybe something like that's happening. Perhaps it's her by his bedside, and uh, he think, or maybe she survived a boat, the boat crash, and he didn't. Uh, and he's like in hospital, and he's slowly dying. But I think it would make a lot of sense the absurdity of it. All right, so the light has gone out, and that was actually my last uh, theory. So we're gonna end tier five there. Uh, I really enjoyed this one and I really appreciate the support everybody um, yeah that's about it really for tier 5 uh, we, we've got one tier left we've got one tier left man it's kind of crazy to think about you know and it's been a wild ride man it's been a really wild ride and I really appreciate every second of it guys so thank you very much get excited for the final tier man it's fucking crazy it's crazy so yeah Take care of yourselves and I'll see you out there neon hunting.